Hi, I'm Lauren Feldman. Uh, thank you for joining us today for SNF Agora Conversations. I am uh, Lauren Feldman, a PhD student in history at Johns Hopkins University. I work on the legal and social histories of women, gender, and sexuality in the United States, and particularly about the process by which marriage and governance became intertwined in the US in the 19th century. I am co-advised by Dr. Martha S. Jones, who is one of the panelists here today, as well as Dr. Ronald G. Walters. On behalf of the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins, I'm excited to welcome you to today's panel, we Women Leading the Fight for Civil Rights. SNF Agora is a relatively new institute at Johns Hopkins that examines challenges to democracy and identifies actionable solutions. They're hosting this conference to recognize the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment and to bring researchers and practitioners together with the Johns Hopkins community and the general public for a discussion about the history of women fighting for civil rights, including the right to vote, to show how crucial women's participation is to a thriving democracy and to inspire future civic engagement. Today's panel will feature a conversation between Dr. Hari Han, a professor of political science and the director of the SNF Agora Institute, and Dr. Martha S. Jones, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History and SNF Agora Institute, and author of the brand new book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. They will spend about 35 minutes discussing the history of how women, especially Black women, have used their writing, activism, and organizing to fight for civil rights and the right for women to vote. Then Dr. Han will open the discussion up for your questions. Anytime throughout this conversation, you can submit your question through the dialogue box, which is right next to the video or just below it, depending on your device. Thank you both for being here. I'll now turn the conversation over to Hari Han and see you all at the end of the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for um, that lovely introduction. Um, we at the SNF Agora Institute are so delighted to have three students um, helping, to, helping with this conference by hosting each of our panel discussions. So thank you, Lauren, for kicking us off. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a really long time and feel like it's really uh, my privilege to be able to talk to Martha about um, her new book and the work that she's doing. So Martha, thank you for joining me in conversation today. You know, um, thank you. Yeah, you know, I feel like, um, you know, the, the book is, I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to read it. And um, it really feels like it's a book for this moment, right? That it, um, it speaks to so many of the particular challenges that we're facing um, in September, 2020. Um, but of course, you know, when you decided to write this book, I'm sure that you couldn't have necessarily anticipated exactly what our world would be like. I mean, 2020, I think, has brought so many surprises for so many of us. Um, I'd love to hear you just start by telling us, um, you know, something about the book's origins and what compelled you to write it when you started writing it um, a few years ago. Yeah, so, um, so again, thanks to you, Hari, and thanks to the Agora Institute for um, hosting um, these three days of really wonderful conversations. Um, I'm really honored to help kick things off. Um, the book began because um, I knew that 2020 was going to mark 100 years of the 19th Amendment and that there would be a great deal of discussion about the history of women in the vote. And even back uh, two years ago, um, there were concerning signs, um, particularly around the um, plans for monuments to um, mm -hmm. the leaders of the women's suffrage movement. There were signs that um, we were in danger of um, overlooking African-American women in that history and perhaps even overlooking um, three generations of scholarship on the subject. Um, mm -hmm. So in some ways, the book is very purposefully timed um, to yeah. uh, be part of the conversation around the anniversary. Um, but you're right, of course, that it turns out to be a book that speaks not only to that commemorative moment, it also speaks to, um, I think, the movement for Black Lives and the 
um, reemergence of that movement is central to our political culture. Um, it speaks to um, the impending election in November and in particular the challenges around um, voter suppression, um, about women's uh, power at the ballot, um, about the nomination of a, a Black American woman um, as uh, the Democrats' vice presidential candidate. And of course, those are things I could not know. Um, but I had to ask myself, in a sense, so was that merely coincidence? Right. And I think not, in a sense, because my view increasingly is that when we write African American history, even when we write it, you know, in the earliest years of this nation, we are often writing into um, questions, issues, concerns, dilemmas that have been enduring, right? And that have extended perhaps sometimes regrettably into the 21st century. And so I think many of us as African American historians um, experience um, perhaps unwittingly how um, timely our work can feel, um, even if it wasn't created to speak to the moment, it turns out that the moment is still speaking back, if you will, to yeah. the histories that we write. Yeah. I want to dive into some of those questions about um, the movement for Black Lives and the conversation that we're having right now um, in our country and, and, and of course the upcoming election, but um, maybe we can start by um, thinking first about the theme of our conference today, which is suffrage. And I think part of what's really powerful about your book is that it reminds us that even as we celebrate suffrage and it feels like there are all different, you know, so many different kinds of celebrations going on, that there is this powerful contradiction contained um, at the heart of the 19th Amendment, you know, that it preached this language of equal rights, but then left a significant group of, of women, Black women, many of whom had really been leaders in the fight for making the 19th Amendment possible, yet they were left out. And as you look around at the conversation that's going on, um, you know, what would, what would you like to see us doing differently? You know, how do we as a, as a nation kind of grapple with um, that contradiction that's at the heart of that history and, and so much, so many other parts of our history? Um, you know, in the one way, uh, in one sense, um, I wanted to um, be a little of the professor and promote yeah. a, a simple lesson. Right, is that um, a careful look at the 19th Amendment is a reminder that neither that amendment nor any part of the U.S. Constitution guarantees us a right to vote. Right? The 19th Amendment prohibits the federal government, prohibits the states from using sex as a criteria, um, but still gives, in particular, the states an extraordinary latitude when it comes to determining who can vote by what terms, by what means. And um, so when we wonder how we got here um, in 2020 um, in, with the resurgence of voter suppression, with um, the fumbling of how Americans will get to the polls in November without um, exposing themselves to the risks of um, the coronavirus, um, the answer is in part um, in a constitutional regime um, that has never um, aspired to guarantee us access to the polls um, mm -hmm. has just placed a set of curbs on the states and then left the states to um, fumble and to put in place barriers. So I think it's a moment that um, and a history that reminds us that there we live with a very old constitution that has been amended many, many times um, but may not be built for our 21st century sensibilities about wh where the right to vote sits in our political culture um, and how perhaps the state should have the burden to safeguard it and to guarantee it to us um, rather than, as is true today, leaving the burden on citizens to figure out um, how to get to the polls. Um, so that's at least one um, piece, I think, um, that this history sheds light on, um, it helps us understand how we got here and perhaps helps us think through um, strategies and perhaps even 
fundamental changes that might keep us from returning to a moment like the one we find ourselves in today. Yeah. You know, I have to, um, I have to say that the, the point that you just made, I think is so powerful, at least in the conversation that I find myself um, embedded in a lot, you know, so a lot of what I do is I study social movements and grassroots organizing and, you know, end up in these conversations about, um, you know, democracy reform, which I'm putting in quotes, because sometimes we have to grapple with that very idea of what democracy and reform <laughs> means, and certainly what they mean when, when they're put together. And I think one of the things that I struggle with in those conversations is that sometimes it feels like when people are talking about democracy reform, they are focusing on how do we, how do we, how can we pass laws, you know, and change things that happen at the level of the state, you know, so when it comes to voter, um, you know, voter turnout, it might be like voter registration laws, you know, all, all these different kinds of things, which are really important. But I feel like part of what you're saying is that, you know, the state only does so much in terms of helping to realize um, both the rights and the responsibilities of, um, you know, what of, um, you know, what it, what we, what we all need to do in order to make, um, you know, make the vote or make democracy um, actually work. And, um, you know, and I know that this speaks to some of your work, some of your previous work um, before Vanguard and in Birthright Citizens, but I wonder how you think about the relationship between like the state or civil society or, or you know, other kinds of, some of those, um, you know, more interstitial um, institutions of our society um, in, in helping to realize the possibilities of, of the vote. Um, so to the degree I think of myself as a constitutional historian of the 14th Amendment, um, now of the 19th Amendment, um, one of the things I'm sure about um, is that um, even those um, sort of lofty and admittedly hard won um, changes to the Constitution um, are at risk for um, falling flat, um, for um, failing to live up to their promise or the ideals that are embedded in them um, if folks on the ground are not then prepared to borrow another metaphor to breathe breathe life into them you know part yeah. of the story of the 19th amendment um, is that african-american women recognize they anticipate correctly um, that despite a 19th amendment um, individual states particularly southern states are going to um, use their laws, poll taxes and literacy tests, for example, um, to continue to keep black women from the polls. What do black women do? Well, um, they have a long-term goal, which is federal legislation that would give teeth to the 15th Amendment and the 19th Amendment, and that will come much later in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. But in the long interim, um, there's a great deal to do, right? Women don't sit down and wait um, for Congress, right, to realize the necessity of a Voting Rights Act. Um, and so immediately black women, for example, establish suffrage schools and they do this in churches, they do it in YWCA's, they do it in women's clubs. Um, what is that? That is an effort to indeed test the 19th Amendment, um, to push on its limits. Um, women teach one another how to pay a poll tax. Um, what is a literacy test? How, what do you need to know to pass one? What is an understanding clause? Um, and they read the constitution together so that they can um, overcome those kinds of hurdles. Um, and that to me is the history of um, the 19th amendment, if you will. That is the history of law. Um, yeah. That law can stand hollow, unenforced, um, and worse, um, flaccid even, um, if ordinary folks on the ground aren't willing and able to do the kind of work it takes to tell us what that law might actually mean. In my kind of legal history, you know, a constitutional amendment is just a text, right? Yeah. So people actually pick it up and discover what, what you can do with it. Yeah. And it's not just that the, that the um, suffrage schools are telling us what it means, but they're making meaning out of the law together, right? Which is, to me, it's such a sort of powerful way to think about the, um, 
the role that we all play in helping to realize a vision that's contained in um, in any one law, um, be it the Constitution or not. So, um, so you have started us down. So I want to actually, you know, part of what I loved about reading your book is that there are so many amazing characters um, in the book, including some of your own ancestors who whose stories really open the book for us and. Um, what I love about it is the way it just makes the history come alive as, as you understand, as we as we as readers come to understand the lives and the stories and the fullness of um, these women. And so I, want to, I wanted to make sure that we brought at least some of them into the conversation today. And I, it was so hard to pick which one, but the one that I thought about um, or that I thought about bringing up was Mary Church Terrell. Um, you know, because she's the first president of the National Association of Colored Women and she worked alongside so many of the suffragists that, you know, might be more commonly thought of in the mainstream conversation or, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And I wonder if you can describe um, for people who haven't yet had that opportunity to read the book a little bit about um, what she did and then also how she navigated the tensions between wanting to fight for suffrage but also recognizing how she was left out of the very fight that she was engaged in, in a way. Um, well, she's a she's a great um, she's a great way to enter this story. Um, Terrell is um, born in um, Tennessee, educated at Oberlin College, um, migrates to Washington D.C. by the end of the 19th century, where she becomes a teacher um, at that city's um, M Street School, which is the um, quite fabled African-American um, high school of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, but she always has an eye on politics and, and Washington is a perfect place for her to land. Um, her politics begin in part through education. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a common story for many of the black suffragists who appear in Vanguard. They begin their professional lives, their work lives, their um, their political lives as teachers often time. Um, she will go on to serve on the Board of Education for the District of Columbia, for example, a pretty remarkable place for an African-American woman um, to land at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but as you said, she's there at the founding of the National Association of Colored Women, which in the mid 1890s is as close as black women will come to founding a suffrage association. Um, they will not join um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association in large numbers. It's founded at the very same moment. And instead, Terrell and others will create the NACW precisely because their political ambition, their political vision, yes, it includes suffrage. And the NACW will have a suffrage department and many of its women will deeply be committed to women's votes. But the NACW is as committed for example, to winning federal anti-lynching legislation at the end mm -hmm. of the 19th and into the 20th century. So black women need a political home that yes, will speak to voting rights, will, but will speak to a, um, civil rights concerns, um, to anti-racism and more. Um, and Terrell's political vision is always that large and more. Um, Terrell um, is remarkable because she never wholly cedes uh, suffrage, the main suffrage stage to white women. Um, she's an admirer, for example, of, of Susan Anthony, um, because Anthony is, is brilliant um, uh, as a thinker, as an organizer, as a visionary when it comes to women's rights. And Terrell will show up at some of the most iconic moments on the road to the 19th Amendment. She'll be there in 1913 when Alice Paul um, holds her um, uh, suffrage parade, um, women's suffrage parade that rivals Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Um, she'll be there when Alice Paul organizes um, women's pickets in front of the White House, um, even during um, the um, early uh, months of the First World War. Um, so she is very much allied there. Um, but the heart of her work is always in the NACW and helping African American women to navigate what is frankly um, a more fraught political terrain, um, precisely because for example, um, by 1914, black women are both supporting a, a federal amendment for women's votes while they're defending against 
open efforts in Congress to repeal the 15th Amendment, which in 1870 had prohibited the states from using race as a voting criteria. Um, so Terrell's somebody who helps us really see um, the complex tensions and the complex challenges that Black women face um, yeah. in political life around voting rights. Yeah. There's one story that you tell in the book, and I'm going to forget the details, so forgive me for if I misstate anything, but, um, you know, about the, the sort of, I think it was the anniversary of the Seneca Falls um, event, and, um, you know, she was invited to be on stage with other very prominent white women suffragists, and there's a little bit of, it sounded like, at least the way I understood it, was some nervousness about what she's going to say, because she was a part of, but also distinct from, in the ways that you talk about the, the um, movement, the suffrage movement um, as a whole. And I mean, I'd love I loved to hear you um, think about that because to me, it was such a powerful story about the ways in which she deft, she and so many of the women that you described in the book kind of deftly navigated this tension of, of both trying to advance women's rights, but advancing women's rights in a way that recognized the inevitable intertwining of race and sex, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Well, you know, um, there's no secret by the time we get to 50 and 60 year anniversaries of the Seneca Falls meeting, um, everyone knows that there were no African American women at that meeting at all, right? And so it is an awkward anniversary at best for black women. Um, there was one black American uh, present um, and on the record, and that was Frederick Douglass. Um, and um, Terrell um, is very moved to be asked in essence to um, the styling of this anniversary celebration is that um, living women now stand in symbolically for many of the folks who had been there during the um, 1848 meeting. And it's Terrell who's asked to stand in for Frederick Douglass. And she um, very much feels herself a protege of, of Douglass um, and um, is very moved, right, to stand in for him right. um, at this historical anniversary. Um, but um, it is also true that um, this is going to give her a platform, and she has already shown herself um, in the context of women's suffrage association meetings um, to be capable um, increasingly of calling out um, white women leaders um, for their increasing um, marginalization of African American women, their increasing complicity, complicity with the logics of white supremacy. This is the era of what is often referred to as the Southern strategy, um, which is to say now suffragists are looking to win the alliance of white Southern women and their lawmaking husbands as they move toward a federal amendment this is bringing on the increased marginalization of black women in the movement. White Southern women are thought to be unwilling to be part of a movement that will include black women. Terrell knows all this um, yeah. and um, it is someone quite capable of calling that out, right? Um, literally. And, um, and it, but you know, her, her sharp words are not exclusive, uh, you know, to white women. <laughs> it's important to say that, you know, increasingly as we move to the 19th Amendment, she will also call out black Americans who are too timid um, and reticent about women's votes. Um, she analogizes that to the um, suppression of black men's votes for too long in the nation's history. Um, and so um, uh, what I love about Terrell, um, is that um, she not only has a kind of frankness, um, she oftentimes has the power to persuade, right? Not always, but she is someone who has developed a, a style um, and a mode of engagement. And of course, this is, you know, the early 20th century when what you do at the podium is so much of who you are, yeah. right? As a, as a political agent, um, your ability to not only hold a crowd, but to change minds um, standing in real time before folks um, is, yeah. if you can't do that, you can't make politics in, in yeah. the early 20th century. And she's really a master at that. 
That's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, the story was, uh, I mean, I feel like that story is just one of so many stories in the book that, um, you know, I think exemplifies so many of these tensions. And so I want to circle back a little bit to the beginning of our conversation, which is the way in which these stories of, of these characters that you're describing, these historical characters speak to this particular moment. And, um, you know, I, like when, um, when I was reading the book, the kind of phrase that's, that popped into my head is just the extent to which the women that you were, whose, whose work you're chronicling, you know, had at their core this, this notion of like the like indivisibility of our human dignity. And, um, and, and that's, in, in some ways it seems so um, silly to say, but in other ways it feels like there's so many spaces in our modern society, it feels like where we're only invited to bring a part of ourselves into that space. You know, we are employees, um, we are, you know, professors, we are, you know, they're sort of like, you kind of segment yourself in, in different ways. And then, and then certainly in our politics, it's like, we can, do, we can give rights, we can guarantee rights for, by sex, but not by race, you know, and we kind of make these trade-offs all the time. And part of the power that came from the women in Vanguard is that, you know, moving through the world as a Black woman meant that there was no choice but to sort of think about these um, you know, the, like the the core of their dignity is being intertwined on all these dimensions. Um, and so, you know, I, like, I feel like in my, so in the world that I live in on grassroots organizing and social change, I feel like, to me, that, that said something very powerful about why it's no accident that we've seen women and women of color so often being at the forefront of so many social change movements, and certainly in the conversation that we're having right now in this country, um, that it's, it's, it's that experience of being a Black woman that sort of um, allows them to kind of reject the trade-offs that society forces us to make. And I'm wondering if, you know, how that sounds to you in a way, if it, um, if it seems so patently obvious that it's not even worth saying, you know, or is it a bridge too far from, um, you know, from the kind of multiplicity and the complexity of the experiences that um, you know, that people have. Um, you know, when I, when I started the book, um, I, you know, you can imagine, I expected to find um, women speaking about equality, right? That was sort of the key word that I anticipated would um, play a role in, um, in encapsulating the kind of thinking that yeah. undergirded Black women's um, work for the vote. Um, and then I, they keep saying dignity. Um, they see saying dignity and they keep talking about humanity. Um, and as much as I was familiar with some of this material, um, there's something that happens when you read it all, you know, across in this book, 200 years together, um, and yeah. you realize um, across time and space, um, yes, equality, um, but as important as dignity. Um, and this ambition, right, to speak for and to um, all of humanity um, is a very old idea in African-American women's political thought. Um, yeah. And I think you're right that it emanates out of um, a historical moment in which Black women, um, with some good reason, you know, posited themselves as the weakest and the feeblest in American political right. culture without being self-denigrating, just right. recognizing where they stood. Um, and here I'm pointing back to the, the mid 19th century and the years after the Civil War, um, that black women believe that if they work through their own experience and they measure American politics and culture um, by their own standing, um, as Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, the poet and anti-slavery activist says, you know, um, you know, everyone will rise with me, right? You know, that um, if, if Black women um, are empowered, if Black women are, um, have the franchise, if Black women um, have a seat at the table, everyone will have a seat at the table because the barriers that are keeping us from um, realizing our capacities in politics are the barriers that are keeping many other people from yeah. finding a place at the table. And that is um, not a winning 
political philosophy from most of the story that I tell, right? Yeah. That it is a very lonely, and perhaps I would say today it is still a very lonely, so lonely. Right. position to take, that I think there's um, too little that's envious about being um, righteous and correct, right, in, in, in some sense, right, of speaking um, a, a vision um, that resonates as almost true for us in the 21st century. For Black women, that is a very lonely position to hold for a very long time um, because um, in what is often called, you know, um, the interests of political expediency yeah. um, might seem more prudent um, to take what you can get, um, work on the other piece another day, um, but again and again, right, Black women experience um, the, the material consequences of that limited vision and just don't, um, just can't sign on to those limited visions, not for very long. Yeah. Um, so I'm just looking at the time and I want to turn to audience questions um, in a minute, but before, and so for um, everyone who's watching, I please um, invite you all to submit your questions. You can submit them at any time just using the dialog box, either I think to the right of your screen or below your screen, depending on the device that you're using. Um, but before we turn to that, um, one thing I, I did want to ask you about, and as speaking as someone who's not a historian, this is you know, a kind of craft that's a little bit um, um, mystical to me <laughs> in a way. Is, I just, you know, I wonder what it was like for you to go into the archives or to do into the historical record to uncover the stories, not only of these, you know, very prominent and famous women, but also your own ancestors. Um, you know, I love the story that you tell at the beginning of, and I'm now I'm forgetting exactly if it was your great grandmother or sort of which generation it was, but you know, who, who walked into the um, movie theater and she sort of say, you know, I imagine her kind of smoothing out her skirt and folding her hands and then refusing to sit um, where they're telling her that she has to sit because she's a colored woman. And I just wonder what it was like to go in and, and uncover the historical record um, of, of so many of, of the characters in your book. Yeah, um, it's very important to say that um, the work in Vanguard stands on the shoulders of three generations of Black women's historians um, who have um, been in the trenches and doing this work, beautiful, um, profound, um, revelatory work um, that um, much of which I draw on. And, um, and while I know readers don't love to spend a lot of time in the footnotes, um, um, the footnotes themselves are a tribute to, to that work. So I want to make sure that folks um, at least uh, take a peek to appreciate um, how much and how many historians um, work goes into a book like Vanguard. Um, but for myself, it was a, um, a fantastic opportunity to revisit some archives that have been familiar to me. And I'm really a 19th century historian, so I had never written, and I actually didn't want to even write into the 20th century. You know, it was kind of the story and my editor <laughs> that said, you must. Um, but I discovered why people work in the 20th century, because the archives get really um, vast and delicious. Right. Um, but one of the things that happens as I'm writing this book is that um, uh, I'm, I become increasingly aware um, that women like my grandmother, my great grandmother, my great great grandmother, um, whose portraits hang on the wall here in my office at home, um, I don't know their stories. And so I take a kind of detour. Um, yeah. I never tell my editor that I do this because don't tell your editor you're taking a research detour and that, you know, when you're on a deadline. Yeah. But okay, I had to. I really did because I thought, how could I um, be telling this story and not know the stories of my own family? And like a lot of families, I'm someone, you know, we do tell family stories. There are like three of them or maybe four, right? And we tell the same stories over and over. And none of them had to do with this history of um, the vote or political rights. Um, and so, yes, I find my great grandmother, Fanny Williams, um, a newly minted teacher from Berea College, um, uh, teaching in Pulaski, Kentucky, um, wow. who takes herself to the theater one night um, and uh, refuses to sit um, in the section demarcated for 
um, colored people um, mm -hmm. and is confronted and accosted um, and ejected from the theater. And that was an important story for me because it rang true to the stories that so many, and she later becomes a suffragist, and it rang true to the stories that many Black suffragists tell um, about um, that sort of confrontation. And it, it, the newspaper relates how, you know, the constable puts his hand on her. And that for me is a chilling moment because there's so many Black women who speak about on streetcars, um, on rail cars, um, the, um, the physical brutality of segregation that demotes them, if you will, from the status of ladies um, and um, comes to regard them as objects, right? To be manhandled, to be assaulted, to be ejected and worse. Um, and so finding that in her story um, became um, a guide, right, for me. And, and then hearing the stories that so many other women were telling that paralleled hers. Yeah. I hope that that story is now going to get shared in your family and <laughs> in, in different ways. Hard for a family though, isn't it? Right. Because yeah. I think that in my family, I don't think we're exceptional, you know, um, in the sense that, um, you know, we, we polish up the stories that um, we tell again and again. Yeah. Um, and um, this one is hard to polish up in a way, even as I admire her, um, she's ejected and she is um, arrested and, in the end, she will pay the fine, right? Rather than risk losing her job as a teacher. Um, that is a deep compromise of a story and um, yeah. not one that is um, unqualifiedly um, heroic, even as I admire her um, deeply. Right. So we're getting a bunch of questions and I wanna make sure that we take a moment to turn to them, even though I have so many other things I'd like to ask, but I wanna make sure that we bring the audience into this too. Um, so we have one question um, that where, the, um, I'll, I'll just read it, it says, you know, to what degree, if at all, do you see modern consequences of the historic conflict between white and black women in the suffrage movement today? Um, <laughs> it's an important question, yeah. uh, because I do. Um, and uh, I'll say that um, let's point to um, women's voting behavior. Um, yeah. and how divergent um, mm -hmm. black and white women um, present themselves at the polls at, often invoked is are the um, the 2016 uh, is the 2016 presidential contest when where in which white American women will will split roughly um, between the two candidates and African American women will overwhelmingly or the 95 or somewhere between 94 and 96 percent of them will um, vote for one candidate, the Democratic candidate. And so Black women come out of the 19th Amendment experience voting as a bloc. Um, they right. organize, they deliberate, and part of the fear of their votes and why some deem it necessary to suppress their votes is that they are going to vote as a bloc and right. they are going to move the needle for the, in that era for the Republican Party. Um, so I take this to be one of the artifacts that black and white women are not part of the same communities of deliberation, of reflection and more. Um, and we see that um, historically and we see that still today um, that women don't vote as a bloc except black women do. Um, and I think that partly reflects how they are deliberating and um, doing the work that gets them to the polls in very separate spheres. Yeah. I think that I love the way that you put that, that, you know, they're not in the part of the same kind of communities of deliberation and reflection, you know, that that sort of the ways in which we make meaning of our existence um, in this society, because they're so divergent that we see those patterns reflected in our, in our politics. Um, so we have another question that's also asking you to reflect on some of the lessons of your book for, um, for the, the modern moment. And um, this question, you know, sort of refers to the idea that the power to persuade seems easier and harder today, that on the one hand, we have more platforms and more people can, can speak out, but there's so much more noise. You know, how do you find the signal in the, in the cacophony of noise that seems like it's out there sometimes? Um, 
are there enduring lessons that we can learn from these women on how best to change minds in, for the, contem in the contemporary area for today's battles? You know, I think one of the, um, and it relates to the first question, you know, one of the um, insights for me out of working on Vanguard was that it's very important to um, be attentive to scale um, mm -hmm. when it comes to these kinds of questions, because as much as on the national level, um, it was near impossible for black and white women to work um, meaningfully together um, on the road to the 19th Amendment and around women's suffrage. Um, that was not true um, at the local level. Um, and there are many examples. Um, the city of Chicago and the experience of Ida Wells probably being the best remembered of them. You know, Wells works on women's suffrage in Illinois and then works on making hay out of that in Chicago um, alongside white suffragists. Um, and on the local level, that is possible, even in 1920. Um, in New York, um, the story is much the same. And so um, I think sometimes um, where we ask that question or where we probe to understand that better, um, it seems to me um, relates to um, scales of how we are heard and who gets heard. Um, and the hardest thing to do in 1920 and 2020 is be heard, right, and sort of move politics on the national scale. That's true in 1922. Um, but it is possible right, on the state level, on the municipal level, um, mm -hmm. to be heard and for voices to matter. Um, so that's not really an answer, but it's an observation, I think, about how we have to be thinking in, in differing scales and appreciate the ways we can be heard in, on some registers, even as it's very difficult to be heard, you know, on something like, you know, a global Twittersphere or whatever. Right, right, yeah. Um, it's so interesting because, I mean, um, you know, so the political scientist in me is, is uh, you know, based on your question is reflecting on kind of, you know, federalism and what we know about sort of how our federal system and the distinction between the national state and local governments has both um, helped, but at other times impeded um, progress on, on civil rights of all kinds. Um, and the, the complicated history of that, I think, is, um, you know, on, on the, sometimes it feels like it's an opportunity and sometimes it feels like it's a, it's a block. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think the point that you're making is, is really important that there are ways in which the smaller arenas create an opportunity to, um, for, for people like Ida B. Wells to um, get, you know, be, be heard in a way that they couldn't have been on the national, on the national scale. Um, do you think it's just about the size of the space in which they're contesting for voice or is there, are there other elements that, that shape that? Maybe that's not a fair question. Well, you know, um, I'm thinking about um, somebody else, uh, another figure in Vanguard, um, Mary McLeod Bethune, um, mm -hmm. who um, goes on to be a national figure of, of great significance, but begins her political life in Daytona, Florida. Um, mm -hmm. And she's in Florida in 1919, 1920, organizing black women to vote, um, confronts um, Klan violence. Um, it's a very important story. But Bethune, um, even before we get to 1920, um, has, has founded a school, an industrial school for African-American girls, and then a hospital. And during the, um, during the flu plan pandemic um, of those years, Bethune opens up her hospital and provides a remarkable and essential service in the city of Daytona. Um, her nursing students um, and her hospital facilities are critical to the ways in which Daytona weathers the flu pandemic mm -hmm. uh, 100 years ago. Why is that important? Because it's, that is the way in part that Bethune builds relationships, even relationships with white um, civic leaders in the city of Daytona. And those relationships serve her well over time. So I yeah. think part of what the scale does is permit us a kind of um, uh, terrain on which to build relationships that are sometimes expressly about politics and party and elections, um, but may be about all kinds of other municipal concerns. And Bethune understood that um, and built those relationships 
um, such that um, when she, her school, her students, et cetera, faced um, challenges, she had allies, right? Yeah. Not, not, not thoroughgoing, you know, radical, you know, uh, yeah. anti-racist allies, but she had real meaningful allies. And I think um, many Black Southern leaders of the, what we sometimes call the interwar years, right? Those sort of years between the first and the second world wars, um, uh, rest um, their accomplishments in part on, you know, difficult to broker and sometimes compromising relationships, but local relationships nonetheless, um, that mean um, that your school, your project, your institution, um, your work um, is, survives, right? In a, yeah. in a climate where not all African-American enterprises, as we well know, um, survive at all. It is the era of the pogrom, right? It's the era of lynching. Yeah. Um, but I think Bethune believes in part that those relationships matter, um, not because they're everything, but, but they're part of the equation. Yeah. You know, one thing I like to talk about all the time is I feel like one of the words that I use a lot, but I feel like it's kind of lost and sometimes in our public dialogue about democracy is the word constituent. And the reason why I like the word constituent is because the um, the like ancient Greek or Latin root of it is constari, which means to stand with. And so I am a constituent if I have made the commitment to stand with other people, um, which to me that notion is for the reasons that you describe is so important to making politics work. And sometimes when we, when we have, when we talk about politics in terms of government having clients or something like that, you know, we lose that notion of what it means to have the kind of relationships that, that you're describing. Um, so I'm conscious of our time. We only have a few more minutes. And so I wanna, um, we have another question from the, uh, the audience, an audience member who asked, who, who asked you to kind of go back and think about the historical moment around the um, passage of the 19th Amendment. And um, I wanna juxtapose that with one question, that one final question that I wanna pose to you about the moment that we're in. And so the audience member asks, um, can we imagine an alternative political strategy that included black women that could have succeeded in passing the 19th Amendment? Um, so it's sort of, you know, is there a counterfactual there in a sense? And I guess I would love to hear you reflect in, in our final moments about, um, you know, where do you draw hope now? Um, you know, or are you hopeful right now, I guess? Um, you know, given the history that you have just delved into for the past, um, you know, if, uh, you know our, our, given the past 200 years of our nation's history and then where we are now, you know, do you, do you feel hope? Um, in this moment? <laughs> um, I really like this counterfactual, even as historians aren't supposed to dabble in such things. Um, I think that if uh, black and white women in the early 20th century had joined forces, um, suffragists across the color line to work toward women's votes, um, including a federal amendment, um, I think there would have been no 19th Amendment in 1920. Wow. I think it would have taken much longer. Yeah. Um, and still, uh, since we've gone to the realm of the counterfactual and the speculative, I'll say that um, I'm of the view that perhaps um, waiting um, for some women's votes, recognizing that many American women are voting before 1920, um, yeah. waiting for some women's votes beyond 1920 might have been worth it if the net result had been a direct challenge to Jim Crow waged by black and white women together mm -hmm. in the early part of the 20th century. We live with the legacy right, of that um, terrible compromise that women made. Now that is not the only root cause of where we are today in the 21st century, but it is one of them. Um, and um, I'm not sure that it wouldn't have been worth it um, right. on, a, on balance to have delayed um, the winning of a, 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 a federal amendment 
um, in the interests of um, challenging Jim Crow. Am I hopeful? Um, of course I am. You know, I come from women who were profoundly hopeful in the face of, um, frankly, much worse um, than all that we face, um, as terrible as it is in the 21st century. Um, and so um, I'm infinitely hopeful. Thank you, Martha, for the opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you. Lauren, I'll kick it over to you. Awesome. Uh, thank you both so much for that riveting conversation. And thanks to our audience for watching and for sending in your great questions. We invite you to tune in again tomorrow for two panels. First, Women Working Across the Aisle, a conversation featuring U.S. Senator Barbara Mikulski, a Maryland Democrat, and former U.S. Representative Connie Morella, a Maryland Republican, which will take place at noon. Then there's Women Working Across the Atlantic, featuring several women who have served in high-level roles in foreign policy and national security, which will take place at 2 p.m. Information about additional conference events can be found online at snfagora.jhu.edu. That's snfagora.jhu.edu. Thank you.